Seasons greetings and welcome to the fourth episode of Spurvac Coast to Coast. It's December 4th, 2021, and we're so happy you have joined us. We have been invited to spend some time with our very special guest, Carolyn Grimes. Now, there can't be many people uh, who haven't seen Frank Capra's holiday classic, It's a Wonderful Life. Well, talking with us today is Carolyn Grimes. As many of you know, she played the role of George Bailey's youngest daughter, Zuzu. Uh, Carolyn has been a longtime friend of our spurred back coast to coast host, Mr. Walden Hughes. So without any further ado, back to you in the studio, Walden. Thank you, Tim. So Carolyn, you want to tell us where are you today? I'm in Denver, downtown Denver. And I'm why? Like, and I, why I'm, are you in Denver? I'm doing a World War II ball. And it's celebrating the 75th anniversary of the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. So, uh, is, is it the event tonight? So, how people that live in Denver, can they come? What, what, what do we know about the event? Oh, well, I think it's sold out. Uh, it's a wonderful event. Everyone dresses like the 1940s. And it's, it's absolutely fabulous. They celebrate all the Christmas movies and they really have beautiful music they have like the andrew sisters they have the big band sound they have everything it's it's a fabulous event and looking at your schedule kill where are you going to be next weekend we might as well give a little quick promotion. oh next week is the seneca falls annual it's a wonderful life festival and i'll be there all week and it's, uh, it, it's been extended this year. It's going to be a wonderful celebration of the 75th anniversary of our favorite movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And for people who want to shop on your store, you have, you have a website, zuzu.net. You have any new products this year that people can order? I from do. You? I have a new cookbook. And it's a, it's a Wonderful Life cookbook. I published it. 25 years, 25 years ago. Yeah, 25 years ago for the 50th anniversary. And so I decided to republish it and do a lot of uh, extensive research and interviews. And so it's got a whole bunch of new information for everybody. And it's got just wonderful recipes. And they're all kind of funky because they're named after the characters in the movie and all kinds of things in the movie. Like for instance, my favorite recipe is Mrs. Martini's linguine. <laughs> <laughs> Are there something named after Zuzu? What the, what the Zuzu recipe? Um, she has ginger snap cookies. <laughs> uh, that's where yeah. I got my name in the movie, you know, was uh, from the National Biscuit Company, they had a product called Zuzu's Ginger Snaps. And when George comes back to his life and he runs up the stairs and he's so happy to see the kids, and I come out my door and I say, Daddy, Daddy, he says, Zuzu, my little ginger snap. So I was named after a cookie. Product placement back in 1946. That's pretty right. good. Right. <laughs> Zuzu, Zuzu, my little ginger snap, how do you feel? Fine. Not a smidge of temperature. Not a smidge of temperature. <laughs> ah, hallelujah. Hello. George. George, Mary. darling. Where are you? George, darling. Where are you? Oh, oh George. 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 Oh, George. Let me touch you. Let me touch you. Are you real? <laughs> Oh, just, 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 George, well, you have no idea what's happened to me. You have no idea what happened. Well, well, come on, George, come on downstairs. Quick, they're right. on their way. All right. Come on. <laughs> come on in here. Now just stand right over here by the tree. That's a Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. And a boy climbed. Uh, any 
any phone behind the scenes noise. There you go. Any 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 stories you want to share? Any stories you want to share about that scene that we just saw? Any anything well, you should point out? For one thing, I didn't know the words to "Old Lang Syne," and I'm acting like I did very loudly, shall we say? <laughs> and I don't think Jimmy Stewart knew the words either because he stops singing and starts laughing at me, and that's kind of how the scene went. And then when I finally figured out what a fool I'd made, I I just laughed. <laughs> Uh, how did you get started in show business? My mother was a stage mom, and she started me when I was four years old. But she had given me piano lessons, violin lessons, drama, elocution, dialect. I did everything, but uh, the only one that didn't stick was dancing. I never could dance. I could sing, but not dance. So she pushed me out. She went took me to see an agent. The agent liked me. She sent me on some interviews. I got some parts and bingo. I started when I was four years old. Did you enjoy it or was it just sort of uh, something to do? Well, I didn't have, I didn't know any different. I mean, mm -hmm. of course I enjoyed it. I mean, it was an adventure every time I walked out my front door, which was really great. But, and really, um, there wasn't a whole lot of pressure on me by my parents to get a part. If I didn't get a part, well, so be it. You know, it was it was just fun. It, and they made it fun for me instead of putting pressure on me. It was uh, a wonderful time in my life. And I think it was a great gift that my mother gave to me. That's nice to hear. Um, talk about the audition. Did you go to an audition part for It's a Wonderful Life? No. No, back in the day, uh, we had an interviews, and the agent that was in L.A. was pretty much the agent for all the children, and certainly all the kids in It's a Wonderful Life, they all have the same agent. And she would go through her stable when they'd ask for a little girl with blonde hair, whatever, and she would send out her kids that were like that. So they would go to the casting office of the studio, and there would be like five of us and we would sit there in the waiting room and then we'd go in and talk to the casting director one at a time. And for It's a Wonderful Life, Frank Capra was in that room and he handpicked every person in the movie, even the extras he handpicked. He was a perfectionist and he knew what he wanted. And so that's what happened. So I, I remember. Well I remember what he said to me because it, it always stayed with me. He said, what would you, how would you show your feelings if your dog just died and you, you really loved him? And so, you know, I, I would get all teared up and get all excited about my dog dying. And, and uh, so that's, that's how I got the part. What kind of director was he? Was he a actor director? What, what what kind of? Oh yes. How did he run the stage? Oh, he was he'd get down on his knees, and so that he could look at you eye level, and that way he could see you and tell you exactly what he wanted you to do, and you understood that, and it, and it was a much be better way to communicate. Did you get did you get the script at once or was it bits and pieces? How how did, was it a work in progress? What was the the script? Like? Oh, you know, we're only given the script that we get for our parts. That's all. You know, you you don't know what the movie's about. Yeah. You didn't know anything. All you know is what you have to memorize and do the very next day and the next day, and that's kind of the way it went. And sometimes you'd memorize th these pages the night before. And then you get to the stage and they've changed the script and you have to go memorize them all over again. That was one of the joys of <laughs> working in a movie. Some of the personalities, uh, what was your impression of Jimmy Stewart as, as a little girl? Well, you know, he was very kind. He was soft-spoken. 
he was very tall and I mean, six feet four and he was thin. So he even looked taller and my goodness, he was so gentle and he always was understanding. Um, when we did the pedal scene, I messed up a line and he said, oh, that's all right, Carolyn, you'll get it right the next time. And I did. And so I really I felt good about that because sometimes the stars weren't so patient, but he was just a delight to work with. Um, after, when the movie started to have its renaissance, what was it, the 80s, late 70s, were you surprised? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's put it like this. 1940, I mean, 1980, I lived in the middle of Kansas and someone knocked on my door and they said, are you Zuzu from the movie? It's a wonderful life. And I said, well, yes. And they said, well, can we have an interview? So I said, okay, I guess so. So I went down to the basement and drug up all my memorabilia and we had an interview. Well, the next week, the same thing happened. And it kept happening. And pretty soon I started getting fan mail. And I thought, what in the world's going on? So I thought, well, I guess I better watch this movie. I had never seen it. And I was 40 years old. And so I sat down and got my family together. And we watched the movie. And I really knew what it was all about and the magic and what a wonderful gift to humanity that that movie really is so i vowed from then on that i would do everything i could to promote the film because it has so many wonderful messages in it and i think we as a <laughs> as as a world need those messages especially now but back then i thought so too so i started on the road in the early 90s 93 for the target company and I've been on the road ever since. Your presentation, has it evolved? Maybe you want to talk about how, how you do a presentation when somebody asks you to come and you show clips of the movie. You have a, a wonderful presentation. Did that evolve over a period of time? Well, yes, it did, because I've, I've talked to a lot of people who the movie has affected their lives. So that has changed a lot of the things I say and, and it, it became even more dear to me because I know what it has done. And I believe in angels. And I really think that people do get touched by angels and angels do come into their lives often. And so I think that's, that's just a wonderful opportunity for me to share with people. And as I've seen more and more growth, of the interest in the film, that also makes me feel good. And, and I know that when they first started watching it in the early 70s, when it became public domain and all the television stations in America could show this movie over and over again, it didn't cost them anything. So that's how the movie got its exposure. And so people, you know, started watching it with their families in the early 70s. And then when their kids grew up, they watched the movie with their families and then the next generation. So I'm old enough to see all this has happened in the past and see how the love for the movie has grown and the interest in the film. And of course, this being the 75th anniversary, uh, it's, it's just on fire. It's wonderful. And it's not only here, it's all over the world. It's the 75th anniversary of one of the most famous and lo beloved movies in the United States, that's for sure. The, what about some of the reaction from the audience? You might have had some touching letters over the years or people who came up and wanted to talk to you. you, you there had to be some time that was uh, very moving after a letter you read or interaction with somebody because they just yeah. enjoyed the film or meant so much to them. I've, I've had so many stories and um, there's been a lot of people that told me they were on the bridge and then they watched the movie and it gave them hope. 
And uh, I've had people tell me that without that movie, they wouldn't be there today. And when we went on tour in 1993, the oldest boy in the movie, Larry Sims, had never seen the film before. And he really didn't want to have anything to do with it. So he, w- he left the holiday, uh, the Hollywood days way behind. Uh, he used to be um, in the Dagwood movies and he was a little star, but he felt like his mother had exploited him. And so he didn't want to have anything to do with the movie industry at all. So, I mean, here he is, an old man, so to speak. And uh, we asked him to join us on the tour and he he had to be persuaded because he'd never even seen the movie. And so the first day we did signings at the, we went all over the United States doing signings at the target stores. The first, very first day that he did one, he was awed. He just couldn't believe it. He came to us afterwards and he said, you know, a man actually came through the line and he said he had really considered suicide. And then he watched the movie and it changed his life forever. He was so shocked. And he was, he was just like, you know, we looked at him and said, well, yeah, (laughs) we've seen this before. And he was just so amazed. And it certainly turned him into a fan of the movie and he was in it. So (laughs) it was a great, uh, it was a great thing to see happen. Did you ever get a chance to, touch base with Jimmy in the in the 80s before he passed away? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. I did. He actually had his, one of his secretaries look me up because people had been contacting him and wanting to know whatever happened to that little girl, Zuzu. And so he found me in the middle of Kansas. And um, so we got together in New York at one of his um, functions. And uh, so we started communicating and, yeah. It was great. It was really wonderful to be yeah. to be meet him as as an adult, and uh, it was great. I really enjoyed it, and so we communicated after that. You did a lot of movies. Any? You have a second favorite after It's a Wonderful Life? Um, no, I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was all about him. <laughs> I mean, every scene, I'm on in his arms, I'm looking at him, I'm with him. It was all about him. I really didn't, you know, maybe we were at the end of the movie and there were all those people coming in and out and we were doing those, but it was all about him. Anything about the bishop wife? Any, any memories of that particular movie? Oh, yes. I loved The Bishop's Wife. Um, I loved Cary Grant. In fact, he was my very favorite of all the stars I worked with. He was so kind and he loved kids. So um, there was a little bit of friction between the adults in the film. I'm sure you know the story that originally Mm -hmm. David Nevin was supposed to be the angel and Cary Grant was supposed to be the preacher. And that didn't happen because the studio head came down and he saw how the movie was going. And he said, no, this isn't good. So he fired the director and he hired another director named Henry Coster. Henry came aboard and he changed the characters. Cary Grant became the angel. David Nevin became the bishop. Well, David Nevin wasn't keen on that. He really wanted to be the angel. And, um, it just, there was some feelings there. <laughs> and so he really didn't hang around with the adults. He just hung around with me. And I just thought it was the best thing ever. He would come get me for lunch. And there really was an ice skating rink on the stage. And he would pull me around on ice skates, pra- practicing his ice skating while I was on a sled. And he just, he would read me stories, tell me stories. I, I never forgot him. He was really my most favorite to work with. And and by the way, in the, in the movie, um, The Bishop's Wife, Henry Coster married a, a 
beautiful woman. And she had been uh, in the horror movies. Her name was Peggy Moran, and she was just mm -hmm. gorgeous. And that was his wife. And he loved her so much that he had uh, a bust made of her. And he put that bust in every movie. And that bust is in The Bishop's Wife. Want me to tell you where? Sure. It's in, the, it's in a couple of scenes, but where you can really see it is where it's next to the music box. When he hears the music and he opens up the box and the music is in there and he plays it on the harp. And that's where the bust is. It's beautiful. Hot. Hello, Debbie. Are you Debbie? Yes. How did you know? Mommy told me. She said you came to help Daddy. That's right. Mommy said you were very nice. Well, that's extremely kind of Mommy. <laughs> Mommy said that maybe with you here, maybe we'll get to see Daddy sometimes. Maybe we will. That'll be enough out of you, Debbie. Uh, I, I asked Matilda to put your lunch on a tray for you. Thank you, Julia. I'll get along very well. Yes, I'm sure you will. Come on, dear. Goodbye, Debbie. Goodbye, Debbie. Bye. Bye. Wow. <laughs> Hung Christian Anderson, any stories about that movie? Mm. <laughs> well, not positive experience. I'll just You're say right. that. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. No, you want to drop in that clip? We might as well let people see what you produce. Get your Copenhagen Weekly Gazette. Get your Copenhagen Weekly Gazette. Copenhagen Weekly Gazette. Matches, matches, matches. Keep my mind matches, matches, matches. Rick a break. Rick a break. All right, I think we should, let's open up to questions from the audience now. Just one and thing. Did you notice sure. that bell? There's yes. bells in almost every movie I'm in. In the John Wayne movie, Real Grand, I carry a bell around the whole time. I love it. <laughs> All right, Larry, you want to open up the chat room, see if people have some questions they want to ask Carolyn? Yeah, I do have a few here <clears throat> to begin with. I'm going to start out with one of mine. Um, Wonderful Life didn't actually come out before Christmas, right? When it, uh, I think it came out after Christmas. Do you know why? And what were they thinking? It, it didn't come out after Christmas. It came oh, I... on December the 20th at the Globe Theater in New York. Oh, okay. I think it was bad timing because it was supposed to be the Christmas movie, but it was too late for Christmas movie. So that I feel like was one of the many reasons that it was not a success. Mm -hmm. at the time. Okay. Uh, Tim asks uh, if that was your singing voice in Hans yeah. Christian Anderson. Yeah. I used to sing, I, I sang opera and I won scholarships to college on my voice. Yeah. Oh, very good. Very good. And I got old and I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Rose Maza asks how your kids and grandchildren feel about Wonderful Life, the movie. I'm... I, I was this mother who didn't discover the movie until I was 40. My kids were pretty much raised, so we never really embraced it as a family. I regret that and will always regret it. We just didn't. And so they really don't have that as a tradition in their families, but they're excited about it and they have to watch it when I play it. So there. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. She also says she wishes you would come back to New Jersey. She saw you in uh, Red Bank 20 years ago and had a great time. Oh my gosh. That has been a long time ago. 
<laughs> yes. Um, in fact, I have a fan there that um, years ago, she she sent me uh, a really lovely gift for Christmas. She had a son who was very ill, and he couldn't go to school because he was so ill. So they did a project together, and they sent it was a gift for me, and they sent it to me, and it was a little pine cone angel. I still have that angel. And then the year, next year after that, he sent me another one. So I have two little pine cone angels that are so sweet and I will remember them always. And one time I finally got to meet her and she said he was doing better. And so that was really something I'll always keep in my heart. <laughs> Very good. Someone else who wishes to be remembered to you, uh, Mark Kausler. And if I <clears throat> mispronounced that last name, I'm sorry. Carolyn, I love your work, especially the bishop's wife alongside Cary Grant. Do you remember my brother, Kurt? He used to write you letters and talk on the telephone with you. Oh, yes. I knew Kurt very well. He had a wonderful collection of Abraham Lincoln things of It's Wonderful Wife, and he loved The Bishop's Wife, but he loved Frank Capra, and he wrote books about Capra. He, mo he was just a wonderful, wonderful fella. Yes, I remember him very well, and uh, I still talk to Linda if he's still on the phone. I, she emails me quite often. Great. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Kurt has passed away a few years ago. Yes. So, um, Another question, my husband is literally obsessed with this movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and watches it 24-7, <clears throat> which is He's what I do with the <laughs> Was Jimmy Stewart as nice in person as he appeared in the film? Absolutely. He was 100% genuine. He wasn't full of airs. He wasn't big-headed. He was a wonderful man, and that was when I was with him later in life, too. He just was a genuine soul. And I have talked to many fans who he helped. And, you know, he never got any publicity for anything like that. And one especially, she had um, contacted him and been one of his fans even before he became a star. And she, uh, he made it possible for her to meet him in New York one time. And then later in life, about three years later, she went out to San Francisco to visit her daughter, and he made it possible for her to come to his rose garden. And he visited with her in his rose garden. And three months later, she died of cancer. But no one ever knows about things like that. <laughs> you know? Those aren't the things that people publicize. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, people want to know about the other uh, cast members. What was it like to work with Donna Reed? And did you ever meet Lionel Barrymore? You know, I, like I said before, I was all about Jimmy Stewart. And I don't really have much memory of Donna Reed. I just, I didn't really have any interaction with her. And so I don't really remember her. But the youngest boy, Jimmy Hawkins, he went on to be um, Shelley Fabray's boyfriend on the Donna Reed show. So he said she was a delightful woman and he knew her all of her life. <laughs> so you think the uh, do you think the film still holds up today? Well, even for young people who who are you know challenged to watch a black and white movie in this day and age. Oh, Absolutely. There's something for everyone in that movie. And I, I really think that, you know, the parents who start their children watching it, you know, they've given them a wonderful gift because they can draw from this movie and the wisdom in it for the rest of their lives. I think How it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I use that word a lot. Yeah, fair enough. How about you? Are you still acting today? Um, who, asked, oh. who asked that? No. No. <laughs> Would you? Okay. Well, if the part well, came along. I can't memorize anymore, you know. I don't want to even. Return to Bedford Falls? You know, you could do a Lifetime movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I ever did anything like that, you'd sure have to put a lot of cards up for me to read because I can't memorize anymore. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see. One, uh, who is that? Uh, Dean says, uh, and I think this is a good one, not really a question, just more of a statement. I just wanted to thank you for helping create the world's greatest movie. It's helped me throughout my entire life, numerous dark times, and has helped guide me through life. Thank you for your awesome work as an actress. I have probably, I've literally watched It's a Wonderful Life easily over a thousand times, maybe 2,000. <laughs> and another oh, one, a teacher, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> a teacher says, uh, I'm a high school English teacher and show It's a Wonderful Life at the end of every semester. It's a forever favorite for many. Oh, so I'm there so you- glad he's introducing it to the high school kids because I think that's what needs to be done to the younger generation. They need to see it. They need to feel it and, and, and learn all the messages from the movie because they're so positive. And we need that in this world so bad right now. And the young people are our future. Very good. Walden? Uh, anyway, Kellen, so you're going to be a best for fall next, next week. And anything else before Christmas? I mean, I, I looked at your schedule earlier this year. It seemed like you're on the road constantly. The well, month. I'm going to be in Oklahoma. And um, they're going to do a showing of the film. And I'm going to introduce it. And I can't pronounce the name of the town, but it's two hours from Tulsa. <laughs> it's Talakuki or something. I don't know. It's an Indian name, and I don't know how to pronounce it. But then after that, um, the Bailey kids have been invited to the celebration at the Academy for the 75th anniversary of the film. And they're going to show it at the new Academy Museum. So I'm going to be going to that. I'm real excited about seeing the new museum. And of course, I love watching the movie on the big screen. And it's, it's just wonderful. Um, you have a lot of uh, leading men you acted with. Uh, I've, I mean, I've got a couple other pictures here, you know. Uh, <laughs> were, uh, you've, got, you've got Bing Crosby here. You've got uh, John Wayne. Um, do you have any story? And Fred McMurray. Um, do you have any stories of any of those other additional films? I, I know nothing about Rio Grande or Pardon My Past. Well, this was uh, Fred McMurray. And Fred McMurray was good with kids. And he was, I had a really good sized part in that movie. And he was very gentle. And I don't know, he took a lot of time with me. And he was patient. And he kind of played with me on behind the scenes too you know he was a nice guy i really liked him and the movie was uh he played twins he played um, my uncle and my father so it it was it was a good movie and it was fun for bing crosby oh my goodness he was just wonderful you know i've heard a lot of scuttlebutt that he wasn't the greatest to work with and all that sort of thing but i didn't find that the case at all he was a delight to work with and even on the set, just me- messing around, just having a good time, uh, Jerry Colonna would come over and they'd joke around and he would include me in all those jokes. I just had a blast with him. He was just the sweetest, most patient man. And of course, he kissed me. I liked that too. And then uh, I guess about uh, maybe two years later, I saw him on the lot uh, on the street in Paramount. And I hollered at him and he hollered at me and he said, Mary Elizabeth, which was my name in the movie. And so I went running over there to see him and uh, I told him, well, you know, I got a brand new dog. And last night was his first night with us and he howled all night. So I decided to name him Bing. And (laughs) there was there was a reporter with Variety standing next to him. So, of course, that was in Variety magazine the next morning. (laughs) (laughs) And the real grand movie. John Wayne was uh, really a tall fellow and very, very loud. But he was very nice. And I enjoyed being around him. His son, Pat, was there. And he was there for the summer. We were in Moab, Utah, and Pat was my age. So we played together and we had the best time. Um, I really enjoyed um, being on that movie because 
it was on location and we got to ride in covered wagons with Indians chasing us and oh, all this wonderful stuff. I, I think it was just one of the most favorite because it was so exciting to ride these things. And I mean, it was like a, a real entertainment for me. We drove along the Colorado riverbanks to go to the farm, which we were working on. And I don't know, I think that it was really great. Maureen O'Hara, um, she had a mouth. Um, when she'd get mad at John Ford, oh my gosh. And one time we were riding in the limo back to the, well, we all stayed in a motel back then. And we were riding back and she was letting go with those curse words. Woo! And her hairdresser said, oh, uh, you know, there's a child in the car. And so I had not been listening until then. And then, boy, my ears picked up and I listened to everything she said. <laughs> and she didn't stop. She was really angry at John Ford. They'd had a real tiff. And everybody walked pretty softly around John Ford. But her, she really, even John Wayne walked a bit softly around him. But when he got mad, you want to look out. It was a very interesting life. <laughs> I don't have a picture, but you were holding a gun in one of the stills in that movie, too, which I think must have been fun. So you had a pistol aimed at somebody. I want to show this other picture from Wonderful Life, though, because that's not one most people have seen. And you were talking about that just before we went uh, started the show. Yes, it's uh, it's a picture that um, Carol Coombs, who played my sister in the movie, she found this when her mother passed away and she went through her things. And there was a little five by seven picture, and it was this picture. No one seems to know about it. It's not in any of the archives. And so we just figured that maybe they took the picture to see if we looked alike or matched as a family. And um, of course, you know, we did, I guess. <laughs> and um, Jimmy Hawkins, the littlest boy in the movie, he and I have both been searching for those toys we were handling. Handing, holding in, in our arms because we'd like to to have a you know an old one like that and uh, we've never found one never and they they were I'm sure pretty common but we have never found either one of those toys. I have a couple more questions from the audience. Um, back to Wonderful Life, uh, you did the scene hanging from Jimmy Stewart's back. That wasn't a stunt double. <laughs> did you get that on the first take? No. <laughs> We went up and down those stairs a lot. And and when he's coming down those stairs, I'm hanging on his back. He's got Tommy in one arm, Mary in the other arm, and I'm just hanging there. <laughs> I've got my feet wrapped around him like a little frog, and my arms are around his neck trying not to choke him. And we did it many times, and he was ever so gentle. He just let me down very gently, and I, I you know, he, it was it was a great experience. but. You know, you never do a scene just once. They did do one in the movie once, and that was the scene, the telephone scene. They did it just once because, well, Jimmy Stewart was a little shy. He'd just come back from the war, and he really was putting off the kissing scene. And finally, Frank Capra said, you got to do it. So he did it, and they decided he and Donna, that they didn't want any rehearsal. They just wanted to do it and see what happened. So that whole segment was shot at one time and neither one of them rehearsed. And boy, that was a hot scene. <laughs> so Capra knew it. And his one of the script girls said, you know, because he said, print it. And one of the script girls said, well, they left out two pages of dialogue. And he said, print it. <laughs> So that's the way it went. It was a great scene. Wow. Um, how does it feel seeing yourself today as this little girl on screen? Can you still feel a connection with that little girl actress? Do you sometimes want to coach her acting maybe? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can you imagine this sing-song voice saying, Daddy, teacher says, Every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. I don't know why Capra didn't make me not do that sing-song thing. Have no idea. 
uh, you know, you see the mistakes you made as a kid and, and you could have done it better, or at least you think you could. But sometimes I think back and I think, well, maybe that's more dear to the heart or maybe that people identify with the mistakes or the misacting or something. So it makes it more realistic. And uh, maybe that's what works, makes a good movie a good movie. I have one more from someone uh, out there, uh, Dean, who says, I am a nurse slash inventor, and I am designing products to help save children's lives. It's very difficult, but two of my products will be inspired by the movie. So if you ever see a product released to prevent kids from drowning in a bathtub, later pools, know that you helped with the passion behind it. And they wish you a Merry Christmas. Oh, wow. What a lovely thing to do. My goodness. Well, I wish you a Merry Christmas wherever you are. And with that, let me turn it over to our president, Tim Kanafa. Tim? You want to All right. Thank you. Can you hear me? Your... Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead. Well, Carolyn, we are just so very happy. We've had a wonderful time. Good. Uh, uh, getting a chance to know you a little bit better and hearing about the, your experiences in the film that we love so much. Um, and it's now my um, honor and privilege to present you uh, with something you've never received before. Ooh. And you can only get it here. This oh. is the Spurred Vac Honorary Member Award. The Society to Preserve and Encourage Radio, Drama, Variety, and Comedy uh, extends to you, Carolyn Grimes, the, this honorary membership and recognition of the great and varied contributions made in the field of broadcasting during the golden age of radio. And we present this to you today, Saturday, December 4th, 2021, and it's given to you with our love and our compliments. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Well, you have given us so much. It seems like a almost inconsequential, but it is uh, something that we reserve to just the very special people that we uh, have a chance to be with and who have made certain contributions. Um, but when I tell you, can I just give you one little tidbit that I didn't mention and I'd like to mention? Please. There was uh, the little girl in the soda fountain scene, Janine Roos, mm -hmm. yeah. played young Violet Bick. Right. She never did another movie, but she did radio. She was on the Phil Harris show for years and years. Really? Well, yeah. I'm sure Walden knows that he has the cast uh -huh. list of every show ever. <laughs> and even the ones that yeah. never made it on the air, he has those oh, too. Yeah. So, wow. but, oh, yeah. but, but that's, that's a great connection. That's, that's terrific. Uh, my, I will tell you quite candidly, um, how much I'm going to enjoy dangling this over my family's head at Christmas dinner that I got to talk to Zuzu and they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, our version of a wonderful life. But Carol, it, is, it has been such a great time with you. We we're, we we hope we can have you back again soon. And I and mention I, and mention the cookbook one more time. Back yes, there. please. You, your Good cookbook. And where, and where do we get it? 75 years of the movie. And you can get it at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, anywhere. Okay. All right. Well, that's... Um, and thank my you. website, zuzu.net. <laughs> well, well, we'll <laughs> make sure that's included in the show notes so people will be able to uh, to find it. Um, anything else, Larry or Walden? No, I think maybe Larry want to announce who we're having next month. Well, right before we do that, I just okay. want to take a quick moment, and I want to thank all of our uh, technical team for putting our show together, that uh, allowing us for uh, Carolyn to invite us into her hotel room, uh, took a bit of uh, on-location work from uh, uh, Zach and our, our, our producer, Larry, who always makes us look so easy. I want to thank you for helping make today's show a success. And Larry, if you can... Give us a heads up on what's coming. That would be great. 
I will do that. Thank you. First, I want to actually mention that uh, if you enjoyed today's presentation, you'd be enjoying being a member. Maybe many of you are, but those of you who aren't ought to join because you'll get great benefits like access to past interviews, original radio recordings, scripts, and other online resources. It's all starting in January, isn't it? Uh, plus, you get the terrific Radiogram newsletter delivered to your mailbox quickly. And all this is yours for just $20 annually. It's quick and easy to sign up. Just visit SpurredVac.com as soon as the meeting is over. Oh, and the January meeting. This was our final Coast to Coast meetup for the year. Our next Coast to Coast virtual meeting is Saturday, January 15th, 2002. Should be a wonderful, wonderful time because our guest will be Roberta Lynn. You like what I did there? She was the champagne lady singer of the early Lawrence Welk TV shows. But her career goes way back to some of the early Our Gang films and crosses paths with Frank Sinatra, The Rack Pack, and so much more. She's a lady with a host of fascinating stories to share. So mark your calendar for January 15th and Roberta Lynn. Well, time's up for this edition of Spurdvac Coast to Coast. Thanks to again to our special guest, Carolyn Grimes, also to Walden Hughes, Zach Eastman, Tim Knopfler, and if I left anybody else out, I'm sorry, but everybody who make, made this holiday broadcast possible. I'm Larry Groby. Thanks for listening, and happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs>